guests, the mass professor. Once more, I'm on the air and ready for human factors. April 20th. Okay, uh, so I hope you're all bearing up well under this continuing coronavirus uh, scare. Um, uh, today is April the 20th, and uh, this class is Human Factors. Um, All right, so we were talking about displays last week, and as we will be today for at least a little while. We'll finish up chapter seven today and move on, uh, uh, excuse me, finish up chapter eight today and move on to number nine. All right, so. Uh, supervisory displays obviously are those displays meant to tell supervisors what's going on. It's one of the greatest challenges in, um, uh, in making a display. That display has to support monitoring in both routine or mildly non-routine circumstances. Hmm. How do we... There, take that. Um, all right, so as we understand uh, from Chapter 7, decision-making, if we're monitoring abnormal circumstances, we're going to need to diagnose the problem or problems. <coughs> We're going to have to solve problems. And we're going to have to troubleshoot the problems. So, first let's talk about ecological interfaces. Um, in that case, the design uses a graphical representation of the process. Uh, some of you probably were along with us when we went to the PowerPoint, uh, power plant, excuse me, in uh, uh, Pruitt. And uh, um, you saw there when we looked at their supervisory displays, that some of those displays showed an outline of the power plant and what was going on in each location. Um, so we have to have emergent features that signal when there's a departure from normality. We would like it if it can help diagnose the nature of the failure using those uh, spatial representations or useful maps that can show a uh, flashing red light, for example, in one location to show that's where the problem is. That lets our operator or supervisor reason at different levels of abstraction. Okay, well, now I'm wondering why I didn't just go ahead and do that last time. The next kind of uh, display that we'll talk about 
are navigational displays and maps. <clears throat> um, well, first of all, there's different kinds of tasks that these would uh, support. Uh, guidance to get to your destination, that's the one that probably we use the most. To facilitate planning, to recover if we get lost, and maintain our situation awareness about the location of objects. Now this can be done in different ways. One way is the old-fashioned route list. Uh, when MapQuest first came out, oh my god, I loved that so much. I would use that all the time to get where I needed to go, particularly if it was a long way. Um, uh, because I could just, um, uh, I would have the uh, what direction to turn on what highway and how long I would then drive on that highway. So it's an Aries of com commands. Oh, wait, no, not Aries, but series of commands to reach a desired location. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, the navigational commands can be words, uh, and uh, as we have discussed before, those voice commands are processed in a different channel. Uh, so when your GPS is giving you instructions, you don't have to take your eyes off the road, and you can, so you'll be able to see where you're driving. So, one thing though is these kind of displays have to have accurate knowledge. Um, I actually ended up having to abandon my old GPS because it, w it really was old. I mean, a friend of mine had had it and gave it to me when his family uh, kind of forced him to get a new one. Uh, it, he had updated it, but I never updated it after that, so um, uh, it didn't always have that accurate knowledge about the right places to go. In fact, sometimes it would do a thing where it would spiral in around uh, a location. So it has to know the right place and, and time and location of uh, objects. Now that printed route list is vulnerable to straying from the path, right? You miss a turn and all of a sudden you're in a brand new territory about how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Computer generated may not be up to date. Well, I talked about that with my old GPS. All right, so the route lists and command displays such as a GPS are uh, a way. Of course, maps are a display. Um, uh, so they have some issues possibly associated with them. There's the legibility issue have we got adequate contrast? Uh, is everything within a comfortable visual angle that we might be wanting to look at? If they're col uh, color coded, we need to use uh, a low saturation of the background, right? In other words, the background can't have a color that's competing with the colors that show us different uh, things on the map. What are the conditions of use? Right? Uh, if it's a map that's got to be read in the dark with a flashlight, does that change things from a map that is meant to be uh, read under a much brighter 
lighting. We need detail, um, but it has to be the right kind of, of details. Um, uh, because our next section is clutter. Um, on electronic maps, very often we have the feature of being able to zoom in on, uh, on a particular location. And more and more, that's as computing power gets cheaper and cheaper, that is going to be our modality. All right, so uh, clutter and overlays on the map uh, are potentially a problem. If we, our map is super detailed, it's bound to get cluttered. That slows our information access and slows also our reading by masking uh, what we're trying to read uh, with uh, what are irrelevant details at the moment. They might be wanted later, but at the time we're trying to read it, it's, um, uh, it's irrelevant. Um, all right, so some solutions we can use, use selective, col uh, effective, excuse me, color coding, right? S that way our selective attention can focus on just one color, right? We know the little towns in the area are in blue, so we look for blue things in the area we're looking at. We don't want to use too many colors because then we get into a problem with our absolute ju judgment. With electronic maps, often we can selectively uh, uh, display a class, different classes of information. Right? We're really worried about finding a gas station. We put it on just the gas station mode. <clears throat> Having that enhanced intensity of our target information is a, is a good way of filtering out results that we don't need at the moment. Often with electronic maps, we can declutter by turning off unwanted categories, right? If everything is just displayed, that may be too much clutter to sort through. But if we can turn off our unwanted uh, categories, that is going to help us a lot. The more flexible our choices are, the more uh, decision load, though, is going to be put on us, right? If we can, um, if we can turn things on and off, change the scale of the map, there may be a lot of learning or a lot of fumbling around trying to learn how to use the uh, electronic map. All right, so one aspect is our position representation. If we represent the current position, that's relieving some of our mental demands on our traveler. It can be critical in recovering from getting lost and getting back on the correct path. All right. With map orientation, we want easy cross-checking between the environment and the map, right? We've got uh, somebody looking at the map. They say, okay, if I'm facing north, then uh, Notre Dame Cathedral must be on my right-hand side. And there it is. Particularly with an electronic map, we want 
that to be oriented in the so that the direction of travel is up. So it's forward and let I and our left is the left on the map. Uh, otherwise, it's error prone and mental resources are uh, uh, consuming, uh, being consumed uh, because we have to rotate the maps in our mind. With paper maps, our orientation is wrong for that for exactly what I've talked about so far unless we're traveling north um, but that map north orientation is useful for when we're planning or we're communicating about the map now electronic maps should also have the option of being able to just make it so that there is a fixed north in other words it acts like a paper map our scale um, well first of all that's going to tell us our level of detail um, and scale or uh, availability um, is um, going to be uh, proportional to the distance from the traveler. Um, on an electronic map, everything that is behind you just falls off your map and, it, and isn't worried about it. But electronic maps, again, should have an adjustable scale. Sometimes we might want dual maps where there's a local map showing the features that are right around us and a global map that shows us where we are in context to a larger uh, picture. So our former is ego referenced, the latter is world referenced, and eight four, figure 814 You know, I'm glad I'm presenting this part Well, Dr. Congolo isn't here because uh, I'm sure he would uh, uh, have a lot to say about maps. All right, so here we see our global map and it blows up into a local map that shows exactly where we are and how we're traveling. All right, three-dimensional maps give us an advantage if we're trying to recognize the view. Um, so, but otherwise, they really um, uh, add to clutter and um, uh, and. Uh, uh, may actually uh, contribute to confusion. All right, so when we're talking about planning maps and data visualization, well, up until now, we've assumed the importance of the traveler. Um, but there are things where that's not going to be the case. 
air traffic control, for example, vehicle dispatch. Come on. Okay, there you go. Vehicle dispatch, is dispatch displays. Blah. Process control mimic diagrams. Construction plans. Wiring diagrams and display of data. All right, so many of the features we've talked about before will still apply. The lev uh, legibility, clutter, um, and all those uh, things are still going to apply in the case of a planning uh, or data visualization map. The costs and de benefits of uh, using 3D become more task specific in this case. Uh, there are costs because of ambiguity caused by the 3D uh, uh, display. So we need to carefully do our task and information analysis before we're choosing 3D and make sure it's really the best way to represent what we're talking about. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves, important, is the vertical information important for decision making? Does the information have to be processed at a very precise level which would indicate don't use 3D? Is it processed at a global level just above or just below um, some value In that case, our depth cues might be important. Um, if we have display viewpoint rotation, we might want to just go ahead and have a two-dimensional uh, view or display. All right, well, included amongst displays are tables and graphs. The um, way we depict our, uh, our data is going to have a strong influence on whether or not it can be interpreted easily by the viewer. So we want to make a, um, an initial choice. Do we want a table? or do we want a graph? One of the, uh, the key consideration is precision uh, uh, that it has to be read at. If we want high precision, we want a table. If absolute uh, precision isn't really part of what we need, then we can do graphs. Okay, so then figure 815 just shows us really quickly. Here's a table with some data, and then here are graphs of, uh, uh, of that data. Okay. So, which one shows us what we want to see? With the graph, you notice it's easier to spot a trend in the data. Well, of course, we're still worried about legibility we're worried about clutter. Oh, holy tuxedos. Oh, here we go. 
right? Uh, the left side is more confusing, uh, but on the right side it displays the same data, but by using different types of lines and larger endpoint icons, they cut down on the confusion. The next thing that we would want to think about is our proximity. Oh, okay. There we go. In figure 818, right, we've got good proximity of our labels and lines. Um, in B, though, you'll notice they have it as a legend instead, which makes it a little harder to access that information. C, we have close proximity of the lines that have to be compared. As uh, compared to D, where the lines are on entirely different uh, graphs. And format, when our number of data points is very large, we're actually getting, getting into the arena of data visualization. Um, okay, are there any questions on Chapter 8? Oh, wait, of course, you can't answer me right away. Uh, but if there are questions, please feel free to send those uh, to me um, by email. All right. So, chapter 9, we start talking about control. Um, so, in, uh, first of all, we uh, talk about the um, uh, principles of response selection. Uh, Hick Hyman uh, created a law of reaction time. And um, uh, those were two researchers working back in the 50s. They came up with the idea that if we just use a, a y-axis of reaction time, a number of actions on uh, the x-axis, they said, well, you know, that doesn't seem to line up well, but if we uh, do it as uh, log to the base 2 of n, we get a nice straight line. Well, good on them, I say. They've got their names in the history books now. All right, so next we go to our response expectancy. Uh, when we have expectancy, that top-down processing that brings knowledge in with, uh, in with our, um, uh, uh, in with our response. Pardon me one moment. The door seems to be blowing open. Well, 
Well, that was kind of a ghost moment. Okay, so with expectancy, that means we have knowledge. We're going to select more rapidly and more accurately what actions we will do. Compatibility means that we want compatibility between our stimulus and our uh, response, right? Uh, so part of that is having an expected location for a control, right? We know where it is, we can just automatically uh, reach for it. The second part of that is what is the expected movement of a control response? If we turn a knob clockwise, we expect that response to go up. If we turn it counterclockwise, we expect it to go down. And then the same uh, situation with um, a slider going up should in, uh, increase response, going down should decrease our response. Of course, part of it is going to be, we're going to have a, a trade-off between speed and accuracy. So there's a positive correlation between a faster response time and the error rate. We also have a positive correlation between our speed and our accuracy. So when we make super rapid actions, we can expect more error. Um, feedback, we want to have some form of visual feedback indicating our system response. But we can also do a kinesthetic tactile response or, or an auditory response. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to take visual right out. Um, so we want feedback between, of what our control state is and the change in the control state. If we can get instantaneous, of course, that's the, the highest level and what we would love to get. If it is delayed, that's not going to be good for rapid actions. Because we may take an action, we're expecting something to happen, uh, and like we're really expecting something to happen this second. Well, if it's a, a, a system with high inertia or some other lagged response, that's not going to be very good. So this is much more harmful with our less skilled operators who may move a control and they're expecting an instantaneous response when in fact it will take some amount of time, seconds or minutes for that to show up in the system. This is not filtered out uh, by our selective attention mechanisms. All right, so when we talk about discrete control activation, um, there are several things we need to think about. First of all, physical feel uh, can be very helpful. They use the example of the toggle switch. Uh, there you've got a visual confirmation. The switch is in the other position than when you switched it. You hear an auditory click, and there's a tactile feeling of uh, the switch moving and clicking into a new position. <coughs> uh, 
when we talk about touch screens, not so good. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm reminded when I went to the ATM this weekend, uh-oh, don't tell anyone, I was out during the Navajo Nation curfew. I had to go to Walgreens to get my uh, medications. But touch screens don't uh, give you any kind of feel. Uh, even those kind of bubble uh, buttons that you have on a lot of microwaves, you have an amount of feel of depressing the button. So when I was working on the ATM, I had to remind myself to wait for the lag of the ATM. I guess my bank is poor and they can't afford a more modern, up-to-date ATM. All right, so the actual size of the controls makes a difference. If we have smaller keys, we're going to have more errors from people accidentally touching the wrong key or touching several keys at once. Particularly if uh, people have to wear gloves while they uh, operate or uh, they've got very large fingers. If we have larger keys and more space between them, then we have more travel time. So that, so we have to strike a balance between how small and how large can we make these controls. Uh, confusion and labeling. Um, sometimes controls are not well marked as far as their function uh, or which is the on and which is the off. So uh, we want to make sure that that is not the case. Um, what we're likely to run into is we have a lot of identical looking controls that are unlabeled and as a result we're not quite sure uh, what they are uh, what they are uh, uh, for or the labels are uh, far uh, farther away from the controls than is prudent for easy interpretation All right, so when we talk about control devices for positioning, first of all, what is the movement time? The movement to reach the control and the uh, uh, movement to get that control um, uh, into position such as the cursor here on the computer or uh, uh, some uh, situation like that. Of course, this is all um, in accordance with uh, Fitt's law. And I thought about um, including uh, movement time equals A plus B log... Uh, uh, to the base 2 of 2.4 divided by W, but it's like, oh, bloody hell. Um, uh, on uh, page 233, though, there is a figure uh, 9.2 uh, illustrating Fitt's Law. Let's see. Two, two, three. All right, there you go. All right, so when we're talking about control devices, we have device characteristics. So we have four categories. 
there are direct position controls. Uh, so that obviously directly positions the cursor or whatever. So a light pen or a touch screen is an example of a control like this. There are indirect pos position controls such as a mouse or touchpad. Uh, you have indirect velocity controls where uh, activation in a certain direction gives you a velocity of movement. The magnitude of the deflection of the control may be part of it to uh, create a proportional velocity. So uh, the types of indirect controls are isotonic, which moves freely and stays where you position it, isometric, uh, which is rigid and produces movement proportional to the force uh, applied, and spring-loaded, where you get resistance that is proportional to the force you apply and the amount of uh, displacement, and then there is voice control. Our usability variables in this case, in this case uh, relate to the feedback of our current state, which must be salient, visible, and hopefully immediate. Okay, so um, so what kind of control we want depends on what the task is, as, as it seems like it always does. So a light pen or touch screen is, uh, they're saying is good for drag and drop. A mouse is better for uh, the range of movement. We look at how much I can move that mouse. Right, and figure 9.3 gives us a comparison um, uh, you can see the, uh, the y-axis is the rate ranking of the devices from the best to the worst. It, uh, the x-axis, we have the touch screen, the light pen, mouse, tablet, trackball, isometric joystick, and displacement joystick. Uh, and it gives you, uh, as you can see, uh, how well each of those work for the speed, the accuracy, and user preference. Okay, well, good to know. Ah, all right. So our workplace environment uh, is going to affect what kind of, um, uh, of display and control we're going to use. So if we have a large display, we need efficient high gain devices uh, uh, so that it's not uh, lagging uh, behind the actual picture. Smaller displays allow more precise manipulation. Uh, the more 
we can integrate our uh, controls with our keyboard, if we have to do a lot of keyboard work, we get a greater benefit. And our workspace size may constrain the availability of our devices. Um, uh, so sometimes we're going to have a very small space and we can't be using some big old honking uh, um, control device. Our direct position controls are not as good when we have vibration. Uh, vibration can be a problem all the way around. Physiologically, it can cause long-term damage to human beings. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, in general, we want to get rid of vibration as much as possible. But if we have vibration, we have to be aware that certain kinds of controls are not going to be as good. All right. Verbal and symbolic input de devices. Uh, using a keyboard or voice control are the two interfaces of choice in this regard. Uh, if we're doing numerical data entry, then keypads or voice control is going to be our best option. If we're talking about linguistic data entry, we might use cording keyboards. Uh, those are ones where pressing several keys simultaneously gives us a more complex input. The hands never leave the cord board. It's less susceptible to re repetitive stress injuries. Uh, we can get more rapid word transit transcription. Uh, unfortunately, it takes extensive learning to use a cording keyboard and it's only knowledge in the head, it's not knowledge in the world. So, some, uh, some places where cording keyboards are used are postal mail sorting and court transcribing. Right, if you've ever wondered how they can transcribe with just those, three, those few little buttons on their uh, machine. There you go. Voice input has benefits, of course. Uh, one uh, utterance uh, could present one of thousands of different meanings. This is particularly good for dual task situations. In other words, you're driving or at airports, apparently baggage handling, they're using a uh, coating uh, on the bags uh, by a voice input. Uh, to have both voice and manual input available is a desirable state. Um, in case you say something wrong, um, Right, you'll, you have the ability then to go back and say, no, that's not what I meant, this is what I meant. And a lot of times, these voice control uh, type programs will correct themselves. If you go back and correct something that they put down because it was wrong, they will make a note of that against what you said, and the next time you say it, it'll come out right. There are costs for voice control. There's a lot of confusability available. There are so many, um, uh, so many English words that are homonyms, for example. 
um, uh, or uh, people with accents may confuse them. And you only have a limited vocabulary size for, uh, uh, for these voice controls. Now, of course, they're getting better and better, but uh, there are also constraints on the speed. You have to take time to train speech systems. Uh, again, they're, they're pretty good right out of the box, but the more time you spend training it, the better it's going to be for you. There may be a problem because you have acoustic quality, noise, or stress. Um, uh, a noisy environment is going to be disruptive, obviously, of that task. And your voice can change when you have more stress so that the system may not recognize you. Voice control is much less suitable for when we are controlling continuous movement. Um, all right, our next section is continuous control and tracking. Often we have to track a continuously moving dynamic target. So our basic elements in the tracking loop, uh, for example, driving an automobile, our human operator perceives a discrepancy or an error between the desired state and the actual state. Then he puts in a controlled out, uh, control output. The reason we say control output is because the input is the perception of what's happening and then the, the output is what they do to the controls as a result. That results in a system output and we say that system dynamics is our relationship between our control put and our system output. Now there can be errors because of command inputs uh, you might hit the wrong button or move the wrong switch or disturbance inputs. Uh, you're driving down the highway you blow a tire and suddenly uh, you are having a hell of a time controlling the car. Our display is our source of information so that we can put in the right corrective action. Right? In a car, the display is going to be the windshield where your primary viewing area is going to be concentrated on the most important uh, part of uh, uh, the driving. Uh, we also have pursuit and compensatory displays in figure 9.5. Okay, so in this case, we see the uh, display uh, that a driver would see. They're looking through the windshield, they see the road, uh, and they may see part of the car. Although more and more, they're dropping the hood enough that you have to really strain to see it. In, on the B side here, the uh, cross represents the actual, uh, the actual position of the airplane, whereas G is the glide path that it should be uh, uh, following. Okay, so, and we can see there's somewhat of an error between glide path and position of aircraft.
Okay. All right, so our input is very easy if there are few corrections, right? We're driving down a straight road, um, pretty easy to stay on task. If it's a very curvy road uh, that has a lot of different textures on the surface, that can be very difficult. All right, so let's talk about the control order. A, po uh, a position control, for example, when our change in position of our control uh, device, hmm, I'm going to go ahead and just put that there. Yeah, that's the ticket. Uh, when it leads to a change in position, that's what we call a zero order control. A change in velocity is a first order, and a change in acceleration is a second order. Uh, personally, in my mind, I uh, uh, relate this to uh, the equations for uh, movement. Right? Uh, change of position, zero order, we're just talking distance. If you integrate that the first time with respect to time, you get velocity. If you integrate that again the second time, you get acceleration. And All right, so, oh, there we go. Uh, right, so here's our first order, our, our zero order uh, control, right? We're talking about um, uh, position, we've got our output and our input. In B, we're looking at the response time of a first order system, uh, right? But there's a lag between input and output. In, uh, and that lag can be quite a lot. Then D is a second order system. Um, we have to tilt the board so that our cylinder rolls back and forth, right? So, um, but E shows us that typically we have a lot of overcorrection and oscillations uh, in a second order system. All right, so when we think about our velocity controls, we want our control devices for first order to have a neutral point that is marked or even one that the control automatically returns to uh, if, uh, if you let go of it. Our second order control systems, acceleration control, can be hard to control. They're more success successful if the operator can anticipate for future error. And our tracker slash operators must be able to perceive um, perceive the trend of what's going on.
Okay, so time delays and transport lags. When we have these kind of time delays or there's a lag because something has to move from one place to another before it uh, comes into effect, we start to have the same problems of anticipation as we do in higher order systems. When we talk about gain, that is how much output for a given amount of input, right? So you would say something is high gain if you barely touch a knob and it jumps up way up on you, right? Where you'd say it was low gain if you have to really crank the knob a lot to get any movement. All right. That brings us to the idea of stability. Uh, first of all, is closed loop instability, which sometimes we call negative feedback instability. So that means a lag in the control loop or the system may lead to a lag uh, from slow human response. If the gain is too high, there's a tendency to overcorrect, right? Which I have certainly gotten into driving a car in the snow. If the human is trying to correct too rapidly, we have to wait until the lag system input stabilizes before we apply another input. Uh, otherwise, you're just putting in so many inputs that suddenly there's a cascade of disasters happening to you. All right, so some solutions to our closed loop instability. We can lower the gain either by actually lowering the gain in the physical control or training the operator not to give it so much input. Reduce the lags if we can. Uh, we may not be able to reduce the lags because it's a high inertia system, but uh, we certainly want to uh, re reduce the lags. Another training issue is changing the operator's strategy. Don't correct every input. Wait and see what the system is doing before you change anything. Uh, we can also change the strategy on seeking our input anticipation and prediction. Or we can change our strategy by going to an open loop idea. So we've been talking about closed loop systems. What is an open loop system? Well, in an open loop, loop behavior, the operator is not trying to correct for just the inputs uh, that come up after the system lags. The open loop behavior means our operator has to have knowledge, know where the target is going to be, and high pow or just how the system is going to respond to the input control. Um, I, uh, um, I remember living in an apartment where it was extremely hard to adjust the controls on the shower. And 
before long, I learned exactly where to set those on the first try so that the shower was at the optimal temperature. Um, next, we have the problem of remote uh, manipulation, which is sometimes called telerobotics. These are uh, situations where direct control uh, uh, is desirable but not feasible. Uh, right? So we're talking about a situation where you're handling nuclear materials, would be desirable to do it in person, but not good for your health. Um, controlling the Mars rover, desirable to do it in person, but not feasible. Right, so we're talking about remote manipulation and or hazardous manipulation. So, usually in a system of this sort, you have time delay. So there's delay between the manipulation of the control and how soon we get feedback, right? So very similar to a high inertia system. Again, the delay may be from sluggishness because it is a high inertia system. Our depth perception and image quality are going to make a difference. Very often we're tracking or we're manipulating in three different dimensions. Um, uh, if we can, we want to have stereo cameras so that we are getting two different views since in one view, something we, uh, a feature of interest may be blocked for us. There's going to be a trade-off between that image quality and the speed of our image updating. And this is going to be much more severe with a more dynamic system. Now, the ideal would be to have proprioceptic feedback. In other words, we would like to have the same touch, feel, pressure, uh, and resistance as when we grasp objects with our hands. But it's very challenging to present that feedback uh, uh, effectively to the operator. Uh, okay, so what are our possible solutions? The most severe problem in most of these type of uh, systems is the time delay. If it's from graphics complexity and it's not updating fast enough, sacrifice some of that complexity. Go to a simpler uh, pictorial representation. Um, we can develop a predictive display that anticipates our future motion and position. That can be very helpful, although it may not uh, be easy uh, to do. We can implement a computer model of our system dynamics where our operator programs the moves they would make into the computer model, correcting that as they need to. Uh, and then the computer implements the model later. Uh, the drawback, though, 
What if conditions have changed? The, um, the input that we have programmed in might not work. Okay, well, that is it for human factors class for today. Um, and I will be uh, posting this video in Moodle along with uh, homework. So, carry on. Stay safe, stay out of trouble. Oh, damn it. All right, there you go. Now you'll get a nice updated outline. All right, that's it for April the 20th, 2020.